Yo, what's good? My name is Reginald, aka the R Star, aka Mr. Straight Fire, and this is Unabashedly Reggie's breakdown analysis to Eminem's verse on Lucky You. Lucky me, fuck you, think? I got a couple of mentions, still I don't have any manners. You got a couple of ghostwriters, but to these kids it don't actually matter. And actually coming from humble beginnings, I'm somewhat uncomfortable. Renounce of a motherfucker about the ones who are here before you. They made rap. Let's recap, way back, and seize that. Recap, gonna take decks, eight deaths with a G. Breaking a minute, got me thinking of finishing everything with a seed of minutes and reaping the benefits. I'm a take. Before we start, if you enjoyed the content at any moment, please hit the like button. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe to my channel. And if you like the audio version of this video, you can go on my SoundCloud page or you can go on Anchor or any of your favorite podcast services like iTunes or Google Podcasts. And all the links can be found in the description below. Some of you might wonder what I thought about the kickoff freestyle and if I might break it down. Sorry, but... I won't do a breakdown for it. I thought the freestyle was cool, but it's too long to do a breakdown of it. So yeah, I thought it was cool. It had some nice word plays, but to me, this freestyle was way too similar in terms of tone and cadence to his Trump freestyle. To the point where before it even started, I already knew how it was gonna sound. Like the the ta da ta da the ta da ta da ta da ta da. Like at this point, Eminem I know will have lyrics. So what gets me excited is the different flows and delivery he'll make. And here I thought it wasn't that interesting how it was delivered. To me, what makes Eminem special is that it's the fact that. For one, he's one of the few who can combine amazing lyrics and also have amazing flows. But in terms of lyrics and rhymes, it was superior to the Trump freestyle in my mind. Moving on. If you haven't checked my breakdown of Jonah Lucas' verse, put this on pause, go check it out, and then come back. You can find it on my channel. And if you want a little bit more info on the song, I talk about it in that video as well. But I'll give a quick recap on the concept of the song right here. First of all, that song is amazing from instrumental to lyrics to performances. The concept of the song is the contrast between an underdog and an underappreciated artist climbing the ladder of success. That would be Jorna. And an artist who's already tasted victory and achieved success but feel underappreciated as well. That's Eminem. So that's where the title comes from. Although in reality, Eminem's part could be titled Lucky Me. Lucky Me can be said when you generally feel lucky, but Slim says it in a sarcastic way like, oh, I have all those awards, sold all those albums, broke all those records, yay, lucky me, but I still feel underappreciated and want more. And basically, that's what the bridge part is about. Now, the reason why it's called Lucky You is because it was originally Jordan's song. He wrote this intro on that sort of hook of, y'all gonna move first, and then he got Eminem on it. Instead of it being on Jordan's project, it ended up being on Eminem's. Smart move by Jordan because it brought way more eyes on him. With that said, on to the breakdown. I got a couple of mentions, still I don't have any matters. You got a couple of ghost writers, but these kids don't actually matter. They ask me what the fuck happened to hip hop. Little alliteration here with happened and hip hop. I said, I don't have any answers because I took an L when I dropped my last album. It hurt me like hell, but I'm back on these rappers. Let's look at the first line. It starts with the use of homophones with manners. On one hand, you have manner, M-A-N-N-E-R, as in having good manners, meaning behaving accordingly in society. And on the other hand, you have manner, M-A-N-O-R, which is a really large house. You see, a manner is a synonym to a mention. They essentially mean the same thing. So because of that, not only is he's playing with homophones, but also makes a paradox. A paradox is a phrase that contradicts itself. So he says that he has a few mentions, but no manners, which doesn't make any sense, but it does because he means manners as in good behavior. So that's the wordplay of that opening lines. He starts the song by flexing his money just like the average rapper by talking about all the mentions he owns but then brings it back to a slim shady attitude and bad behavior. Now the ghost writing line is what made everyone think that he was this in Drake. A ghost writer is someone that writes someone else's lyrics but without having the credit. For example, it is known and accepted that producers like Timbaland and Dr. Dre have ghost writers. Fun fact, Forgot About Dre was all written by Eminem and still Dre was written by Jay-Z. But when it comes to quote unquote real rappers, ghostwriting used to be something that if known would kill your career. After reference tracks leaked and it showed that Drake didn't write all of his lyrics, a lot of hip hop heads thought that his career would be over. But nope, it didn't affect him at all and years later Drake is still on top of the rap game and breaking records after records. So when Eminem says to these kids don't actually matter, it's hard not to think he wasn't referencing Drake. Plus I feel that dimensions and manners, wordplay and the cadence, cadence is the type of wordplay Drake would make when he's bragging about his money. But again, in that Kamikaze Sway interview, M said he wasn't dissing Drake and would never do so because he has a lot of respect for him and he did something really nice for his daughters. All he was saying is that he, the great Marshall, doesn't need ghost writers. Now I just want to give my own opinion on Drake. You might be surprised to hear that, but he's actually one of my favorite rappers. I don't like everything he does, but when he raps, I think he's one of the best. But I have to admit 
The, the leak tracks made me see him in a different light, but I do believe he writes most of his songs. Plus, it's a known fact that he wrote for Kanye, so he already writes for other people, so it'd be weird for him to have a ghostwriter. I think it was a situation where he was on tour and feeling a lot of pressure to release new music, so he sought some help. I personally think that's lame, but I still know he has true talent. Moving on. Of course, that L that Eminem took is Revival, and it wasn't just the critic who had been panning his album to death. <laughs> Fans also didn't respond too well. In fact, since Infinite, it's his album that sold the least by far. As of September 2018, nine months after, it only sold 392 physical copies in the US. To put that into perspective, since the Marshall Mathers LP, all of his solo album have sold over 600,000 in their first week. And Kamikaze, just after a month and a half, has sold 415,000. So indeed, he's back on these rappers. And actually coming from mumble beginnings, I'm someone I'm comfortable winning. I wish I could say what a wonderful feeling. We're on the upswing like we're punching the ceiling. But nothing is feeling like anyone has any fucking ability to even stick to a subject. It's killing me. The inability to pin humility. What I like about that first line with the assonance created by the um sound and his choices of syllables, just the writing itself kind of gave it that Migos mumble rapper flow, which he's trying to mock. So me just reciting it, it sounded like I was doing that overused flow, plus the repetition of that um sound, it almost sounds like mumbling, and he did that just with the writing. Then he makes a simile with upswing and punching the ceiling. Being on the upswing means that things are getting better and improving, but upswing is also a homophone for up swing, a swing upward like he would be punching the ceiling. And I think that nothing is feeling has a double meaning because he kind of says it in a way where it could end a sentence. In that case, feeling could hide a homophone of feeling, which would mean that he feels that a lot of today's rap is not feeling or precisely fulfilling, meaning that it has no substance. Plus another homophone with pin humility, which could also be pin, B-I-N, as in pinning pin up pictures on your wall all day long. And that could also go with stick to a subject. All in all, in those lines, as it has been his motto for the past year or so, he's once again letting how he's displeased with the current state of hip-hop, where he feels too many rappers can't make actual songs with real subject, and all they do is boast and exaggerate everything. That's why he says, inability to pin humility. Bitch, be humble. <laughs> ha ta ta ba ta ta why don't we make a bunch of fucking song about nothing and mumble and fuck it, I'm going for the juggler. Shit is a circus. Consonants here with the S sound. Shit is a circus. You clowns that are coming up don't give an ounce of a motherfucker. Obviously, ha da da ba da da is Slim making fun of that Migos flow because that's kind of what it sounds like with the mumbling. Now, I'll give credit to the Migos for making that flow popular, but then after Drake followed, everyone copied it too, it seems. It became the, the official mumble rap cadence. That's why Eminem is clowning that flow. Speaking of clowning, there's a great lexical field around circus in those lines. Circus, clown, and juggler, which hides a homophone. Going for the juggler, juggler, which means relating to the throat or neck, means to go for the kid like a lion on his prey. But the wordplay and homophone is with juggler, as in juggling balls, something you see at a circus. And I'll be real, it's only when I started analyzing that song that I realized juggler had two meanings. What a word, Smith, that Slim Mathers. Also notice that he says they don't give an ounce of a motherfuck, meaning they don't really care. Not only did he use ounce to rhyme with clowns, but also because an ounce is often a unit of measure when talking about drugs, and a lot of mumble rappers focus their lyrics on talking about drugs, something he addresses later on. The next part is one of my favorite of this verse. I love the rhyming with the two syllable patterns, either with the E ap ac or the A and ap ac sound about the ones that were here before you that made rap, let's recap way back, MCs that wreak havoc on tape decks, ADATs. Tape decks, cassettes, and ADATs are old formats of, on which music was recorded in the past. Here's a little bit of history. ADAT stands for Elise's Digital Audio Tape. It was created and introduced by Elise's Studio Electronics in 1991. This digital tape recorder was revolutionary because each ADAT could record eight tracks and you could combine multiple machines that could add up to 128 tracks. Of course, compared to today, that's not impressive because anyone can just download Fruity Loop, right click and create as many tracks as they want and just mumble and auto tune on each and every single one of them. <laughs> Anyways, back to the lines. Where the G raps and Kane's at, we need three stacks ASAP and bring maps to A's back because half of these rappers. The previous lines are about the new generation of rappers and listeners showing no respect for the old school. He echoed the same sentiment in Maj Majesty's verse when he described a date with a girl where he played some Slick Rick and Souls of Mischief and she was like, all that old school hip hop is over. Plus in the past few years, you've had a lot of new rappers discrediting past MCs like Vince Staples saying the 90s were overrated. 
That's why, as I explained in my The Ringer breakdown, Eminem sent him shot. So message to all you young up and coming rappers, don't you ever fucking disrespect the Caterpillar. So M names a list of OG rappers that he feels the game needs back. Three Stacks is Andre 3000 from Outkast. Remember, Andre was fifth on his list of greatest of all time until I collapsed, and the three other rap MCs share something in common. Cool G Rap, Big Daddy Kane, and Master Ace were part of Marley Mall's Juice Group, a group of rappers from New York. Eminem has tremendous respect for all three, and he mentioned them in the past as his influence. Some more info. M and Cool G Rap were both on Sway and Tech's The Anthem Song. Master Ace was on Hellbound with Eminem. And finally, Big Daddy Kane is considered one of the most influential and skilled MC in hip hop history. In fact, Eminem's multi, multi syllable rhyming technique is an evolution of Big Daddy Kane's. Big Daddy Kane's style is what first created that bond between Eminem and Proof. As Marshall said in Yellow Brick Road about the start of his friendship with Proof, we was on that same shit that Big Daddy Kane shit with compound syllables sound combined. So you gotta thank Big Daddy Kane for bringing D12, Proof, and Eminem. Let's continue. Cause half of these rappers have brain damage, all the lean rapping, face stats, syruped out like tree sap. Let's stop here for a moment. I did say it was one of my favorite part and that's because of the rhyming. For most of the lines within each of them, it alternates between the A act app and the E act app pattern. So if we pay it closer attention, made rap recap. Way back and sees that. Same with the next, although he starts with the E sound. Recap, A dats. G rap, Kane sat. Three stacks. And on the next line, ASAP, bring Matt. A's back, these rappers. And that will go on for the rest of those lines, minus a few exceptions. So to me, the whole switch up from E and then A and then E and then A is incredible because it's not a co coincidence. You have to realize this. When he was writing, when he got to that part, he self imposed himself this structure and decided to follow it and yet still get his point across to big up rap legends. That's incredible. Lean, which is a mixture of soft drinks like Sprite and cough syrup, is also called Scissor or Syrup. Since a lot of mumble rappers rap about it, Eminem makes a reference to it. Tree sap is a fluid found in trees. It's basically the blood of the tree since it carries the energy to the branches. There are two different types of tree sap, and I'm sure you're already familiar with one of them. That would be maple syrup. Indeed, that's sap from a maple tree. Therefore, after saying syrup out, that's why Eminem made a simile with tree sap. I mean, for a guy who flunked ninth grade three times and dropped out of high school, he sure knows a lot of shit, man. I don't hate trap. I don't want to seem mad, but in fact, where the old me at, the same cat that would take that feedback and aim back, I need that. Here what I like is that he acknowledged the fact that he could be perceived as the, this bitter old man mad at the young kids. Then because he knew that his retaliation on Kamikaze would have people say, oh, look at Eminem, he can't take criticism, he's just mad because he's irrelevant. He reminds us that the old him, the Marshall Mathers LP days, Eminem, was the guy who would fire back at his critics or anyone who said anything negative. Remember Will Smith said he doesn't have to cuss in his rap to sell records, so Eminem said, fuck him. I love Will Smith, by the way. And in that same song, The Real Slim Shady, he also addressed critics. So a reactionary album by Eminem is not a new thing. That's the old him, the one his fans have been wanting. And it seems he also needed that. In that Kamikaze interview with Sway, he said, there is something inside me that is like, I'm a little more happy when I'm angry. There's a rush that inspires me to say something back. Hey man, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to get notified when I make another video. And if you want to support this channel, go to my Patreon on patreon.com slash unabashedlyreggie. Just giving a dollar a month is greatly appreciated. That will give you access to the full rhyme sheet and the extended version of the breakdowns when there's more content. Thanks in advance, on to the next part. At that moment, it's when he starts to shift into next gear. And what I like is that he didn't drastically go into full speed as he often does. Instead, he took two steps to get to that rapid fire part. Let's check it out. But I think it's inevitable they know what button to press or what lever to pull to get me to snap though. And if I pay it attention, I'm probably making it bigger, but you've been taking your dicks in a fucking backhoe. Get it? Look at the repetition of the T sound, which gives a nice bounce to it. Tank, inevitable, day no. Button to press, to pull, to get me to snap dough. But a cool rhyme is inevitable with lever to pull. The reason why I find it cool is because I always find it nice when he rhymes one word with multiple words. When you hear Eminem say, get it, like he did on Criminal, I was just checking the mail, get it, checking the mail. You know that there was a wordplay in that line. This one actually took me a while to get, but it's actually simple. At face value, that line, of course, is about some intense, serious ass fucking. Get it? But he uses homophones as he often does with dicks and backhoe. You see, a backhoe is a type of excavating equipment attached to a tractor that is used for digging, keyword digging, because when he says dicks, it also sounds like digs. So that's the wordplay he did with dicks and backhoe. Tope.
Now, to me, that line is not just about critics saying things that can make him mad. I think it's actually about rappers dissing him, and specifically MGK. What's the one thing that we all know that if you talk about, you'll get Eminem's attention and piss him off? That would be Haley. That what started the beef between Slim and MGK. And as M said, he was debating releasing Killshot because he didn't want to make Machine Gun Kelly bigger. Now that super fast part. If you've seen a lot of my videos, you probably know that I'm not a big fan of those rapid fire sections he seems to do often in his verse. But this one is probably one of my favorite he's done in years, which I'll explain why in a few. Let's check it out. On the brink, any minute got me thinking of finishing everything with a seed of minifin and reaping the benefits. I'm asleep at the will again as I peek into thinking about an evil intent of another beat. I'm a kill again, cause even if I gotta end up eating the pill again, even ketamine or metamphetamine with the minifin, it better be at least seven years, 300 milligram, and I might as well, cause I'ma end up being a villain again. Whoa. For almost the whole section, the Ian Ng sound was landing on every beat. So like you saw, it creates a nice rhythm even when you slow it down. Although there are a lot of colors, but within that you have subtle internal rhymes like brink any, thinking, reaping, big into, even, and eating. The reason why I like this more than other fast raps he has done is because in this one, it doesn't feel like he's just rambling. Like I personally felt that the fast part in Chloroseptic was rambling with the lunatic computer chick and proven hooters chick. Whereas here, he addresses a more serious topic with his addiction and he almost seems to admit that he did better music while on drugs. That's what I think he meant with reaping the benefits. That line of finishing everything could be interpreted as suicide, but I interpret it as undoing 10 years of being sober by reverting back to pills, but he would reap the benefits of being more creative. Here's some info on the drugs he's listing. Acetaminophen is basically a headache pill like a Tylenol. Ketamine is used for anesthesia and as a painkiller. They say it can produce vivid dreams and a feeling of mind-body separation. So that can make you pretty high. Metaphetamine is what is at the base of crystal meth. Shout out to Breaking Bad, best show ever. And Minithin are pills that gives you energy and they could be bought at gas station. Some call them legal speed. They contain ephedrine, which is a drug that can be used to create methamphetamine. That's another reason he mentioned it. And remember that hook? You know me, I'm your friend, when you need minute thin. Yep, that's from Sh I'm Shady on the Slim Shady LP. But seriously, kids, don't do drugs. Normally, asleep at the wheel is an expression that means that you're not paying attention or failing to do your job. In that case, because he talks about drugs, it could be about literally falling asleep at the wheel. But I think he's making a double entendre with the expression, doing this in my sleep. Since he's talking about killing a beat, he's saying that he can do it with no effort. Finally, being a villain again is a reference to being shady again, a persona that is associated with drugs, so he thinks he might as well take drugs if he's going back to his shady ways. But don't worry, he wasn't being serious. Let's continue. Levels to this shit, I got an elevator. You can never say to me I'm not a fucking record breaker. I sound like a broken record every time I break a record. Nobody could ever take away the legacy I made. I never cater. Levels of this shit is a slang used to say that even if things appear to be the same, they might not be equal and there's a hierarchy to them. In this example, you can't just take a successful rapper and compare him to Eminem just because he's successful. Because Eminem is on a level of his own, his level of success is unmatched. That's why he follows it with bragging about breaking record, and of course saying he got an elevator is a reference to his relapse refill song, Elevator. Sounding like a broken record is when you constantly repeat yourself, so Eminem is using that expression to play on the act of breaking records when it comes to record sales. Moreover, Eminem prides himself by having sold millions of records without conforming to norms or having to sell out. That's why he says, I never cater. To cater means to try to appeal to someone or a group of people. Motherfucker, now I got a right to be this way. I got spite inside my DNA, but I wrote till the wheels fall off. I'm working tirelessly. Hey. Here we have two nods to Kendrick. The A is a nod to Kendrick's humble where he raps, this shit way too crazy, A, you do not amaze me, A. And Eminem also did a similar flow. And Spite Inside My DNA is a reference to Lamar's DNA song. But not only does Eminem have Spite Inside His DNA, he's also delightful, Eiffel, he's the new Ice Cube, and that's why motherfuckers hate to like him. Besides an alliteration of W's, the second line has a nice wordplay. Until the wheels fall off is an idiom that means to do something until you're no longer capable of doing it, until your body just breaks down, or until the end of time. But to make a metaphor with it, he uses its literal sense and connects tirelessly with it. So when the wheels fall off, your car is tireless. And working tirelessly means working without stopping. On top of that, road, the way he says it, can be a homophone to road, which is the past tense of ride, which goes with the whole vehicle theme of that line. Now on to the final lines. It's the moment y'all been waiting for, like California wishing rain to pour, and that drought y'all been praying for my downfall. 
The state of California is known to have long periods of drought to the point that in some parts of it, when it rains, it's news. So yeah, farmers there definitely wish for rain to pour. Plus, there's a double meaning to downfall. First, a downfall is when you lose power or no longer are at the top. Then its second meaning fits the rain theme because it also means a sudden heavy fall of rain or snow. Last lines. From the 8 mile to the south ball, still the same marshal that outlaw that is say as a rider might have fell off and back on that ball like the cowboy. Eminem uses those closing lines to remind us that he's never changed, that he's still the same guy he was over 15 years ago to now. To do so, he references two soundtracks and movies, the classic 8 Mile and the 2015 Southpaw. Fun fact, Eminem was very close to be the leading role in that movie instead of Jake Gyllenhaal, but then backed out due to scheduling and also because he doesn't see himself as an actor. Finally, the last two lines have a dope lexical feel around the Old West. Marshall, a play on his name, but also a marshal, which was similar to a sheriff. Have you been playing that Red Dead 2? Outlaw, Bull, and Cowboy. Actually, not only that, you also have Rider, which hides a homophone of Rider, as in someone who rides a bull. So he concludes it with another metaphor. A rider that fell off of a bull, but now is back on that said bull. And you have the expression being on that bull shit. In his case, back to his shady ways. Man, that song might be my favorite on Kamikaze. Great job by Joyner, and even greater job by Marshall freaking Mathers. That's it, folks. That was my breakdown analysis of Eminem's verse on Lucky You. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below what you would like to see next. But until my next breakdown, this has been Unabashedly Reggie. Thanks. It's been real.